Hey everyone, welcome to Our Small Footprint. Today is uh, smoked bacon. I made some homemade whole grain mustard and um, what else did I do today? Dutch baby pancakes or walls of Jericho. So to try out that uh, apple pie filling that failed. So come along and see what happened in the kitchen today and I will see you again tomorrow. Thanks for watching guys. We started the morning today with Walls of Jericho or Dutch Baby Pancakes. This recipe is from Three Roads Homestead. It's a, I've made variations of this recipe in many, many years, but her ratios are just really simple. So I grabbed it off her page and used that. First thing you need to do is you need to melt butter or in our case ghee in your pan. So you put a, a good knob of butter in the bottom of your pan and stick it in the oven so that it melts and heats up. Then you need to mix up the batter. So for this batter, it is 18 eggs with two and a quarter cups of flour of your choice and two and a quarter cups of liquid of your choice. So I put 18 eggs from our chickens in there. And of course, being chickens, being eggs from our chickens, I cracked them into bowls before putting them into the batter, just to double check. I used plain all-purpose flour for this batch. I have used a multitude of different types of flour, but I just grabbed plain for this particular one. And then I used two and a quarter cups of coconut milk. Now, I couldn't remember how many cups the cans equated to, uh, and it ended up being just under two cups of coconut milk. And now because I buy the coconut cream, not the coconut milk, it's quite thick. And sometimes when you add something like that to a batter, it's too thick. So all I did was I topped up to the two and a quarter with water, and that will thin out that coconut cream a little bit more to be, to be more like coconut water. Uh, sorry, not coconut water, coconut milk. Uh, I don't see the point in buying coconut milk cans because they're the same price as the coconut cream, but just with less coconut solids. So that seems to be a bit counterintuitive. So I blended the, all that up in the thermix because you want to try and get some air in it. So you can just mix it by hand, but it won't end up as fluffy. If you can get some air into the batter, then it's definitely preferable. So I did it all into the in the thermix and whipped it up well, and then poured it into the hot pan and then stuck it in the oven. Now it's variable on how long this takes. You really just want to make cook it until the middle of it isn't wobbly. Like it has a bit of wobble to it, but not, hmm, how to say that? It has a bit of a jiggle to it, but not a wetness to it. Uh, I cooked it at 200 because that just was where my oven sat today um, and just kept an eye on it. After that went in the oven, I put some stock on for the dogs. So this stock that I make, I make it regularly and I've done it quite a few times on the channel. I do get asked regularly about the onions and the garlic content that I put in my stock. Now the guidelines for onion and garlic with dogs are yes, that they can be toxic. Uh, and if you avoid them, then that's fine. But the ratio of onion toxic for dogs is about 100 to 150 grams of onion per kilo of body weight of the dog and the garlic is i think it was 30 30 to 50 something like that 30 to 50 grams of garlic per kilo of body weight for the dog to become toxic some dogs obviously are going to have more sensitive stomachs than others but that's the rule of thumb so when we make our stock uh, this entire pot of stock is split between four dogs over many days. They only have like a cup of this with some dry food. So the ratio of onion and garlic in it is negligent for them. I also do tend to pull the big chunks of onion out if I can see them before I'm pureeing it for the dogs. So because this stock was for the dogs, I used two big bags of the chicken thigh and skin leftovers and I put a whole bunch of sweet potato in it because we have all the sweet potato from the hampers. If I was going to use this stock for myself I wouldn't put sweet potato and all that skin in it because it would be too fatty and the sweet potato really alters the color of the stock. It's not clear it ends up being very cloudy which isn't very nice for a lot of uses. So I don't tend to put things like zucchini or sweet potato or things that are going to almost dissolve in the stock in the stock if I'm going to can it because it just doesn't it just doesn't look right. I pulled the bacon out to put in the smoker. Now I've been a little bit slack with the bacon this month. You're supposed to sort of rotate it within the container every day and you're supposed to uh, 
drain some of the liquid out so that it, uh, it it's sitting it's sort of dry curing in the fridge and I just got sidetracked so I quickly flipped it over a few times but I didn't pay as much attention as I should so it's only semi cured but that's fine because as I've said before we don't make bacon to store long term we make it to eat within the month and the few days post smoking and then what we don't eat I slice and I freeze in portions and we eat over the rest of the month uh, if I was making this to store of course I would have to be much more careful about the technique and the quantities of salt but because I'm not I'm lucky I can just be a little bit lazy so what I did was I pulled it out of the fridge I rinsed the salt off it and then I drained it off and I put it and also you're supposed to put it in the fridge for a day after you uh, rinse the salt off and stuff to create a pellicle but one of our fridges isn't working at the moment so we've only got one fridge and I just didn't have the room to lay it out on a tray for that to happen so I'm smoking it straight from wet <clears throat> this just means it's going to be a lot more moist and a lot less dense uh, but I stuck a probe in it stuck it in the smoker and cooked it until it hit 150 to 165 Fahrenheit which I think is around about 72 to 76 Celsius uh, the Dutch slice, the Dutch baby pancake, or the, the Walls of Jogo, came out of the oven, so I sliced that up. Now, the reason I made this today was because we had a little bit of surplus of eggs, but also because I wanted to use a jar of the failed apple pie filling uh, to see how the kids liked it over the top of something. It worked perfectly like this. It really is very much like a apple caramel. Uh, jam sauce that sort of thing rather than a pie filling the apples have really just disintegrated into nothing but it tasted really nice on something like this and I will have to make some pancakes and stuff too to have it on to use up the jars that didn't seal otherwise I'll make a apple crisp or something or you know just something to use it up before it goes off in the fridge since those few jars didn't seal but everyone really enjoyed the Dutch baby pancake it's a really nice high protein breakfast and it's but it's light and fluffy it's something that's well received here and we make it a lot in spring when we're drowning in eggs the other thing I did today was I made some mustard now I had planned to make a few different varieties of mustard today until I realized that I was on the end of my last apple cider vinegar jar I have a honest to goodness order that should come through next week where I bought some five liter apple cider vinegars but for the moment this was all I had and I didn't even have any homemade for some reason so I could only make one batch so I just made a, one of my standard whole grain ones because I'm going to use this on a rub for the pork in the next couple of days uh, and I just use one cup of brown seeds, one cup of yellow seeds with three cups of apple cider vinegar and one and a half cups of water. And you just put it in the jar, mix it up and you leave it alone for <clears throat> a few days is fine. 24 hours I think is minimum, but it depends on your temperatures and stuff too. You want, they swell. So when you see the jar afterwards, the the mustard seeds swell and take up space in that uh, apple cider vinegar so you want to allow it to do that so I normally leave it for a few days I do do a fermented one as well and I do a maple one and a honey one and I am going to try Dijon so I will be sure to share them over the next couple of weeks once I've got the ingredients back to do that um, I didn't realize I was so low on apple cider vinegar until I went to do this so I mixed that up put a lid on it and put it aside for the moment this is what the bacon looks like out of the smoker so as you can see it's definitely more bouncy than my previous bacons and that's due to the fact that it hasn't cured quite as well so the curing takes all the liquid out of the meat uh, all the water out of the meat sorry and makes it a much more dense cured product and I was slack and didn't do it so this is a lot more like a still resembles a pork belly rather than bacon it's going to taste the same though because the the salt and the sugar will have permeated the meat but it's just going to have a slightly different texture which is fine once it cooled uh we i sliced some up for dinner we had some uh sourdough with bacon and tomato and things like that for 
dinner so this is what it looks like when you slice it once it's cooled so it still looks like bacon uh, and it fries off like bacon you have to be careful if you make homemade bacon it cooks really really quickly so you can put it on the pan and turn away and come back and it's starting to burn and it burns into just charcoal like it's really unpleasant and for such a expensive cut that we've put so much effort into you definitely want to make sure that you get it right so it really only takes very brief cooking times and it just tastes delicious and but you can eat it straight like this like daryl uh i think in this clip daryl steals a piece while it's and it's still semi-warm and of course it's cooked because i smoked it uh, but, and it tastes a little bit like smoked pork belly uh but with the texture of that bacon it's it's really nice it's well worth we don't do it every month because it's it is an expensive cut of meat but when we do make it we very much enjoy it I put this clip in because I mixed the mustard up a couple of days later and I am that far ahead of my videos at the moment. So I thought I'd show you this clip. So this is the what the mustard looks like after it's soaked for a few days. You can see how the uh, mustard seeds have really absorbed a lot of that liquid and they've swelled in that liquid. Uh, you then just need to blend it and basically all you're doing is you're cracking the mustard seeds to create more emulsion and to make a, a thicker product. You can drain some of that liquid off if you want to make a thicker end product. Uh, you can just take it out, put the seeds in to be blended, and then just add bits of liquid in as needed. I don't tend to do that because we use most of our mustard for cooking purposes, whether it's in mayo or it's to, as a rub around the pork or it's in my sausages and things like that. So we tend to use it thinner rather than thicker, but it does thicken up in the fridge anyway. Uh, you'll see it in the next couple of videos when I pull it out to make the various different things that I do with it so it does thicken up in the fridge anyway and we have had times where I've pulled some liquid out and because I've done that when I've gone to use it it was kind of dry and almost crumbly because it just didn't have enough liquid for it to pull up and once you crack those seeds they're going to absorb more liquid as well so it's personal preference but I tend to just pour the whole thing in and blend it I did it in my thermomix and I did it at t for 10 seconds speed 9 and then I scraped it all down and then 10 seconds in speed 9 again uh, and you're just cracking those seeds so it you can use anything you want you can do much smaller batches than this too if you want um, I just do a big batch because I have plans for it we have quite a few things that I'm going to do over the next few days that are going to need mustard you can can this as well and if I had have done a few different varieties like I had planned I would have canned this in jars but because I've got things planned and I only did the one batch I'm just putting it in jars in the fridge it lasts a really long time in the fridge anyway so it's not like you have to use it up particularly quickly uh, it is mustard after all so I just put it in some reusable jars in the fridge for this batch and uh, next time when I make the other varieties I will can them as well and I'll share that with you too so that I've got a variety of different mustards on the shelf and I can open whichever sort I want whenever I want for whatever I want. Alrighty that was it for today thank you for joining me again and I will see you again tomorrow uh, we're still working on apples and pork and things like that so come along and see if you're interested.